every day I see a new platform trying to kind of connect investors and entrepreneurs or do a bit of that process that you know do the deal flow analysis and stuff like that but you know there are so many platforms that there's not going to be any one that solves all the problems and it's going to be quite a fragmented market We have discussed on the show many times before that female participation in the tech sector is going in the right direction, but still has a long way to go. And this is clearly reflected in the amount of female-led technology startups pursuing investment. When I found out about Angel Academy, we were determined to get the founder, Sarah Turner, on the show, an experienced entrepreneur in her own right. Sarah has built an impressive network of investors committed to assessing startup and scale-up business opportunities led by female and mixed founding teams. We talked about how Sarah assesses an investment opportunity, uh, what typical mistakes founders often make in their investment journey, uh, the proliferation of AI technology, what sector Sarah is most excited about, and much, much more. What, What a great episode. If you've not listened to the Tech Leaders podcast before, this is a perfect place to start. Sarah has everything you look for in a guest and some more. It's Sarah Turner. So Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the Tech Leaders podcast. I've been really excited to speak to you. Thank you for having me. It's a a pleasure to talk to you. Likewise. And so we always start with this question. I'm particularly interested in hearing your take on this, but what does good leadership mean to you, Sarah? Right. Okay. It's an excellent question. Um, I, you know, personally, I think it's about leading by example. I've always thought I wouldn't ask and couldn't ask people to do things that I wouldn't be prepared to do myself. I think it has quite a lot to do with integrity and reputation. I want to be seen as trustworthy. I want to be able to trust other people around me. I think those are probably the two key things. I I had yeah. some very good bosses early in my career and those are those are two principles that they they stuck to as well. They didn't talk about it, but I realised on yeah. reflection <laughs> that that's what they were very good at and that's what I admired about them. So do you mean in terms of like sort of saying what you doing what you say and saying what you do type thing then, just having clarity on your intent? And- yes, and transparency and yeah. genuinely supportive of other people, not just not just saying what's convenient yeah no absolutely I think that's uh, I think when it, it's authenticity isn't it when you're authentic with your message it really shines through doesn't it you know no that's a really good really good point so Sarah some of the listeners may not be aware of yourself and Angel Academy so I want to dig into your backstory and uh, maybe just do a bit of an introduction to yourself so why don't we start with the early part of your career why did your career follow the path it ultimately ended up following what what got you into this into this sector and this this direction well i think a lot of lucky accidents really it's easy to look back on your career and say it was all well planned <laughs> career path but um i actually got into tech because i graduated into a recession it was really hard to find a good job. And, you know, in those days, you were grateful for anyone who would employ you. Um, Things were a little bit different now. And I found out about this master's course that it was a conversion course for people who'd done a arts and social sciences degree, which is my background, and teaching them about technology. Because at that time, there was a shortage of people who could kind of communicate and sit I suppose between the coders and the customers and uh, translate yeah. that because you did a history degree I believe yes history yes and politics. it was history yeah. and politics so absolutely fascinating my university was a hotbed of uh, revolutionary activity and stuff really exciting to be part of that but you know no yeah. obvious career path afterwards but actually the transition into tech is is not that hard it's not that insurmountable and there are opportunities, whatever your skill set. You don't have to be a programmer or, you know. Yeah. I, I went in as a, a kind of project manager and then we were making digital media stuff. So it's 
a bit sort of a producer as well. Well, do you know what, Sarah? I did a history degree too, and I too work in the tech sector. Yeah. <laughs> and I too do a little bit of media as well, as we are, yeah. So we've got quite a bit in common, I think, maybe. Yeah. But uh, So talk us through the early part of your career then. You you said after you obviously you completed your master's and then you, you, you got into sort of project governance, project management. Was yeah. that your first step into the IT technology world then, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, a lot of my colleagues on the master's course went off and joined banks and were earning kind of double my salary, I suppose. But I was kind of very hooked on digital media. It was a very exciting time. You know, none of it worked easily. It was, you know, real wild frontier stuff. But it was the point at which users interacted with computers. And that's what I love, the sort of the communication side of it so I was kind of project managing and producing some very early digital media efforts we were still making stuff on (laughs) cd-rom and then we kind of moved into the the web so it was all kind of it was all about problem solving it was all about bringing clever people together to sort out particular problems trying to do it within these very unreasonably small fixed budgets (laughs) and make some money (laughs) for the company at the end of it. So um, I I, I loved it, but it was hard. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I can imagine. And especially being such a new medium up against traditional media at that time. So you obviously were part of the startup founding team of an organization over a four year period. Looking back now, Sarah, that, having that, that experience of being part of a startup so early in your career, what did you learn yeah. from that experience What that, that set you in good stead beyond you know, when you exited? So this was my second job in tech, leading this kind of brand new network that was about connecting all the digital media businesses in Brighton and across Sussex, of which there were quite a few. We had some real pioneers in that area and basically kind of trying to promote that community and put it on the on the map. And we were yeah. very much the first organisation of that type. So we became a model for lots of other regional initiatives as well. It's very exciting being on the ground floor of something and basically kind of, you know, creating something from scratch but you know I was lucky I joined the organization had a bit of funding we had to kind of make it sustainable within a a period of years but we had some funding to go on so that gave us some space to to kind of experiment and speak to lots of people and just sort of focus on some particular areas to to develop that would then lead to a sustainability plan for this particular business so I think I I learned a lot about building community building relationships bringing people who in some areas would co- compete with each other but in other areas could collaborate so yeah, bidding sure. collectively for bigger projects and things like that and it got me into contact with other startups so other other entrepreneurs who are building stuff from scratch and leading the way on this wild west frontier of the uh, of the internet yeah absolutely obviously it was a very again it was a very exciting time with lots of startup activity probably for the you know for the first time at that scale in the UK would you say there wasn't really an explosion of entrepreneurialism pre the dot com days what was there Sarah is, is that fair to say I think that's that's absolutely right you know of course we've always had entrepreneurs in this country but I think what happened was it was the first wave of infection by that Silicon Valley spirit where you had yeah, not sure. just entrepreneurs but you had people with money that were investing investing money into these businesses so they could grow not just at a typical organic pace but really charge super growth and so that yeah. was very exciting it all felt very very new there was only a small number of people doing it so you could quickly form connections with everybody it was a really yeah, exciting sure thing to be part of and um, that has sort of stayed with me throughout my career. So could you give us a snapshot? What was it like to raise capital in those days? You know what I mean? Uh, into, how would you go about finding investment for your startup in the in the you know the early 2000s? You know, I, what was the process? You know, you would come up with an idea, you would start doing a little bit of work on it, you would kind of create a, a pitch deck, you know, business plans weren't needed it was a pitch 
pitch deck, you know, fairly punchy, concise. And then you would try and take that to to investors. So, you know, there were some people who were angel investors. So these are individuals, often had had a business themselves before, like to invest in other other individuals at an early stage of their startup growth. So relatively small amounts of money, but very personal. Was that done via brokers? Or? There were things called angel networks, not very many of them, but where you had groups of investors who clubbed together and invested together. And then there are other people who are just kind of very well networked, so would meet entrepreneurs and invest that way. And then yeah. there's another group of people, venture capitalists. So these are institutional investors. These are people investing other people's money. So they tend to get involved a bit later once a business has got, got a bit more bit more legs, a bit more what we call traction, but all looking to get involved in very exciting, potentially high growth yeah. businesses um, in the hope that some of them, not all of them, would yield outsized returns. Yeah, sure. So there was clearly an appetite brewing for, you know, investment in new ventures. It's exciting. Obviously, the, the, the dot-com bubble exploded but it felt like this was year to stay. Do you know what I mean? The entrepreneurial yeah. spirit within the software technology industry was, you know, it had potential, doesn't it? So uh, talk us through that that sort of period afterwards then. And, and it seemed like you were bitten by the bug, if you like, of the startup yeah. and scale-up world. Um, how did that play out for you in terms of right up until when you set up Turner Hopkins? So after that, working with startups with scale-ups, um, yeah, as you say, you know, definitely bitten by the bug. I then moved into a period of um, doing consultancy and a lot of the same sort of work, but it was kind of more on an international scale. So this was working on projects, open innovation. So working with some large corporates, many of them international, and trying to connect them to the exciting startups and scale-ups that existed in the in the UK, so around yeah. different different areas of emerging technology and the corporate partners would either invest or buy from these startups. Um, So that was a very exciting space and another way, I suppose, of kind of continuing to support startup businesses and stay at the cutting edge of innovation. Yeah, no, absolutely. This episode is brought to you by Be Digital UK. Be Digital are a trusted partner to leadership teams of technology-driven organizations delivering ROI-led solutions across cost optimization and also data and AI adoption. So obviously you set up Angel Academy whilst, you know, at the same simultaneous with with Turner um, Turner Hopkins. Can you can you talk us through how that came about and um, just give us a little bit of a, an overview of Angel Academy and what, what the purpose of the company is. Yeah, so so Turner Hopkins was our consulting business, so innovation, partnership, consulting business. I'd got to a stage of my career where I had a little bit of capital that I could invest. I started doing some angel investing, went along to these networks, was usually the only woman in the room and certainly the only woman angel investing, I think, at that time. You know, it just got me thinking about, you know, where are all the where are all the women? And, you know, in the odd occasion when female founders came and pitched to these groups, (laughs) the conversation inevitably didn't go well. Um, all those cliches that, you know, you've you've heard about female founders getting different questions, it really did sort of play out in front of my eyes. I could see that. And it just got me wondering that what would happen if there are more female investors in the room, that the, the conversation might be a little bit different, not just for the female founders, but for all entrepreneurs. And where are the where are the women? Because I know plenty of other women like me that have got an appetite for risk, have done reasonably well in their careers and would be make amazing investors. So that yeah. was the germ of the idea. I set it up as a you know, a side hustle alongside Turner Hopkins. So I started running events just to see what would happen. And the first event we did, it's quite a long time before we formalised the business, was um, in, in 2012. It was part of the Digital Olympics during the London Olympic Games. Oh, wow, um, okay. We were 
lent a very nice entertaining space a pop-up space that had been put on and you know it ran an event and it was called angel investing for women and i thought i was targeted women who would who would like to be angel investors but actually all the people yeah. who turned up were founders looking for money mostly female entrepreneurs who had great ideas so you know i, I knew that the deal flow was going to be there because one of the things that you need for angel investing is you need access to good opportunities. So there are probably about a yeah. hundred women looking for investment that turned up at this this event, but only a tiny number of women who who sidled up after me and said, "Oh, I'm interested in, in investing." And actually, you know, that has been the harder part of the business to grow. Speaking to women about angel investing, what it takes to be an angel investor, and why they should think about doing it. I know it's not going to be for everybody, but I would like women to at least know about it and decide actively whether it's for them or not. So this has kind of become the the mission. Um, I was just going to say, Sarah, I interviewed a lady called Catriona Campbell, who works for Ernst & Young, and um, she's the CTIO of Ernst & Young. Okay, She's a, a lovely lady, uh, very, very successful, experienced but her background was banking, and um, and, I, and I remember her saying that um, that she basically had a startup idea quite early in her career and took it to a load of investors, and um, they pretty much said to her that they had concerns about her being a female entrepreneur, so therefore they wouldn't invest because she was at an age where maybe she would be, you know, having children or whatever. Okay. They, I don't think I said that in those words. This was going back a while, obviously. Clearly, there are challenges for women and have been. And I do think that is changing and going in the right direction. Whether it is fast enough is another, another conversation. But so, but, but why do you think there was such a deficit of female entrepreneurs at that time when you started around, the 20, around 2014, 10 years ago? I mean, female entrepreneurship has grown massively, I think you know, to the point I made before, more people are talking to women about it. I went to university, I did the milk rounds. Nobody ever mentioned entrepreneurship as an option. And I didn't even consider it, even though my my dad was actually an entrepreneur, although he always referred to himself as self-employed. So, you know, even the language has changed. So nobody talk to us about it. I think, you know, there are expectations on us about what we might do. Um, I think we do have a slightly different attitude to risk. And frankly, you know, if we hold ourselves back from being entrepreneurs, I'm not sure it's a bad thing. I think that, mm. you know, female thoroughness approaching things more carefully is is no bad thing. And it's not risk averse, it's risk aware. So, you know, the women I've noticed who start businesses um, take a bit longer to reach that decision, which means they have bigger networks. They know more about the area they're launching a business into. They might have some savings to fall back on, which is vitally yeah. important. So, you you know, they're more considered about it, which might mean there are fewer number of us, but there are probably fewer of us failing in our businesses because we've given it yeah, a bit sure. more thought. We've had lots of discussions about this and, you know, I think there are societal pressures, there are perceptions. You know, I was speaking to a male investor who'd been looking at this and he's saying that, you know, actually that he felt that women weren't allowed to kind of borrow money or be in debt or have loss-making businesses, that, you know, men are given a free pass on that because they're yeah. potential unicorns, but women are expected to demonstrate revenue straight out of the, the gate. So there are all sorts of challenges. But Yeah, um, sure. So it's a complex picture, isn't it? It's really complicated, and I don't think there are any easy answers or easy solutions. But we've just had Atomico, which is, I think, you know, one of the largest VCs in Europe set up by the Skype founder. Every year they do a State of European Technology report. Part of that every year is looking at gender statistics, and all female founding teams got 3% of the euros invested across European venture capital this year. 
a little bit right. more if you're in a mixed gender team. But if you're in a mixed gender team, that normally means that the CEO is a male. So, you know, yeah, sure. women are finding it harder to raise capital. It takes them twice as long. They raise much smaller investment rounds. So, you know, those barriers are are very real, despite the ever-growing number of female entrepreneurs. There's lots to unpack there, but I think it, it is a complex picture. But I think that in order to address this, Sarah, we probably need to look at it at grassroots level, don't we? And I think ultimately, I, I'm a father of two daughters, and I would love them, one of them to enter the technology or software industry. And I would also love them to be ambitious. And I think those are the two things that we need to be conscious of at grassroots level within our education system are we pushing young women towards more uh, unintentionally mad towards more stereotypical careers inadvertently okay and i think that's what we need to probably look at but we are now nine years down the line i think it feels like that there is definitely progress being made um, yeah i'm certainly i know personally a couple of female entrepreneurs within the software world how much progress has really been made by something? Obviously, you're a much more informed opinion than I am. How much progress is being made, in your opinion, and how far have we got to go? I think progress has been made. That 3% of all investment <laughs> dollars we're talking about is up from right. 2% last year. So yeah. it, it's slow, but there is progress. Um, as we've talked about, there are far more women building businesses, but also tech businesses, highly scalable tech businesses. We at Angel Academy have invested in, it's just about to be 49. <laughs> so, you know, there's they are there. These brilliant female founders are there. There is recognition, even if it isn't translating into investment money, that, that something, something structurally is wrong, that women are kind of not getting anywhere near their fair share of the pie. And I think, you know, that awareness and that knowledge is one thing. And there are way more angel networks now. Our investment ecosystem is much bigger, much more active. There are lots and lots of VC funds. We now have a lot of the big American VC funds have got their European presence in in London. So okay. there's a lot more capital around. There's a lot more entrepreneurs competing for it, but the whole sure. the whole ecosystem has grown. And then, you know, as you all know, how technology's changed in that period, it has transformed our lives and especially coming out of the pandemic. In the investment world, there is just this old cliche that, you know, you can't do an investment without looking into the whites of someone's eyes. And then lo and behold, when we couldn't do that, actually, we were managing to make it happen over Zoom or Teams or whatever yeah. it was, because you, you can actually build relationships if you kind of invest the time in in doing it so um yeah, sure. you know a, a lot of what we do became more productive because we weren't having to always organize events and things like that so there's been some productivity benefits definitely so help entrepreneurs how does your angel investor network what do they do for entrepreneurs what do they bring to the table what, what is the sort of unique selling point of the angel investor network well our our unique selling point is well, and there's more than one here, but we're a mainly female community, which is pretty unusual in the investing world. But we've been going longer and we are writing bigger checks, I'd say, than the, the other kind of gender or um, diversity focused networks. Do you take mixed founding teams? We do. Yeah. 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 We're looking to support female Founders, we are investing in sole female founders, teams of just women, but also mixed gender teams. So as long as there's okay. a female founder that owns a decent chunk of the business pre-dilution sure. and is in a senior role, then we're very happy to consider it. It's, you know, I always make the point, this isn't about keeping men out. This is about supporting no, more, of course, of more course. women. I don't, think, I don't think anyone would see it like that, Sarah. But, but yeah, <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's great. I mean, it's, 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 you know, look, it's really good, especially for female entrepreneurs, would get a lot of assurance, okay, entering into a, you know what I mean, a conversation with someone who runs a female orientated investor network. Do you know what I mean? And that could be the difference between them pursuing investment and not, you know? I think that's it. You know, we hear it from a lot of the entrepreneurs that we meet that, it, you know, it's so nice talking to women. Um, our style of questioning might be a little bit 
different. Our style of operating is, is I think it is quite different, you know, and it's a nature of what we do that we have to say no to quite a lot of people. <laughs> but we try and say no in a constructive way and give feedback so that if people kind of come back to us again, you know, they've had some helpful advice and you know, they, they might have a better chance the next time round. Yeah, sure. What's the main pieces of advice you give to very early stage female entrepreneurs who maybe they've got a product developed or something, but they, you know, they, they, they want to scale it. What do they do for, you know, to, to get themselves noticed and find investors? And, and how do they just get going, Sarah? Well, I mean, the first bit of advice I always give founders is, you know, get as far as you can under your own resources before you go yeah, out sure. and you ask people for investment because the more value you can create <laughs> at an yeah. early stage, the more you will be valued by the market. So do what you can to try and prove what we call traction. So some progress in your business. Then make sure you target your investors carefully so you know if you are a really st early stage business it's no point speaking to an investor that invests at what's called series a so that's quite a few steps on from you you'll just be wasting yeah. your time and there so target people who are investing at your stage and in your yeah. Sectors. So, so just to be clear, you, you, your in, your network looks at pre seed until investor A. Is that uh, sorry, exactly until, sorry, it, until Series A? Yeah, you don't look at anything beyond that. Yes, okay. broadly, we Pretty might follow much, yeah. on beyond that if we can sure, afford it. Yeah, but yeah, we we yeah. we tend to participate in those those early rounds. We're not investing in anything that's still an idea. Yeah, sure. Typically, have to have... not investing in things that are an MVP. MVP. You know, you 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 can get something to market relatively quickly and cheaply now. Yeah. There are founder loans that you can take out, and or grants you can leverage, and all sorts of different things to help get that early funding. I know it's tough, but you know. As an investor, I want to see that the founders have got some skin in the game as well, that this isn't a job for them and they're just expecting investors to come and pay their salary. So, you know, you've got to be entrepreneurial and have hustled your business to, to showing some traction. Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. So the, the other thing is, you know, be super organised, most half decent investors will have some standard questions and things that they'll want to see from founders you know one of the main things is your EIS or SEIS pre-assurance so this is something from HMRC to say that um, you are eligible for those tax breaks which is what most UK angel investors are after but you know set up a data room with your financial model your deck any employment contracts, any commercial contracts in there, all the sort of information that somebody who's doing going to do due diligence on your business will want to see. And then, yeah. you know, you don't share it with the world. You want to check who's accessing that information because it's sensitive. But if you find an investor and you think they're trustworthy, then make that available to them. So what we're looking at during this process is kind of, you know, how entrepreneurs are handling themselves, how they're responding to our questions. If they're surprised by their, our questions, then they're probably, possibly, you know, it shows they're a bit naive and inexperienced. If they've got the answers to hand, we'll think, wow, you know, they really know what they're, they're doing. So, yeah. you know, you, you can do lots of things to get yourself ready and get organised. That's really good advice. I, I got to ask you this one though, Sarah. What do entrepreneurs do wrong or do badly at this sort of pre-seed to seed level? Come to calls with investors unprepared. So, you know, one of the first steps once people have submitted an application is to invite some of those applicants to a screening call with the investors. And although it's relatively informal, we do send instructions about, you know, what, what will happen on the call and what we expect. And some people just ignore it and they turn up and they've been asked to talk through their presentation for 10 minutes they either don't have a presentation or they ramble on for 20 and it's just sort of you know if you're oblivious to how we work it doesn't create the the best impression and it eats into somebody else's time as well so yeah. you know be aware of the dynamics be be prepared be emotionally 
intelligent about this because it yeah, is sure. about connecting with people and respecting people. Yeah, sure. So how are you finding the investment landscape right now, Sarah? I'm hearing stories that VC money, for example, is is quite is a bit more difficult to come by than it was. The flow of money is a little bit slower than it was, say, you know, a year and a half ago. What is your sort of take on the current investment landscape and, and what do you think is driving whatever those trends are? It's a really tough environment. We are paying the price of a bit of over exuberant behavior a couple of years ago. So post, the um, post COVID. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. You know, that, during it? COVID and coming out of COVID, everyone was just making these assumptions that, you know, growth and adoption of these technologies will continue like this and that, you know, behavior will remain the same. And although some things have changed, we're probably all spending a bit less time watching Netflix, aren't we? And there are lots yeah. of other services. So, you know, the, the, the world has come back to normal a little bit and um you know a lot of our investments that you know had achieved nice valuations in the market are if they're in the unlucky position of having to fundraise again are having to go back with much more modest valuations Uh, actually as an angel investor getting involved early it's a good time to be investing but it does take a little bit of confidence that the market is going to recover so a lot of good entrepreneurs have been um uh you know laid off from the scale-ups they were part of they've taken that experience they've started businesses themselves so there's some really good founders coming through in the pipeline and modest valuation expectations so we can get in relatively cheap now but you know i think People are feeling a little bit poorer and it's very hard to be confident while all this terrible stuff is going on around us. And it does feel like it's one sort of economic or, you know, global shock after another at the moment, doesn't it? So Yeah, it does. But I think it, that does make total sense. I think there was there was definitely over exuberance post COVID. There was so much money flying around. It just feels like everything and anything was getting invested in. I think we're in a position now where it's, it's this term corrections, the, the market's having a correction, isn't it? And I think the reality is setting in now and profit and, and profit is kind of like more important than growth all of a sudden. And I think that needs to happen, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, all the mantra of growth at any cost and throwing throwing money at user acquisition, that's, that's all gone away for the time. Being. Yeah. yeah, and it's sure. probably a more you know realistic, it's more so sensible got, market you know, right now, I suppose, isn't it? A more sensible market, but you know, unfortunately, we had this sort of you know over exuberance followed by over correction, and you know, it's a really tough market to be a startup raising money yeah. at the moment. Even if the business is doing well, we've got lots that are doing well and having to be a lot more modest in terms of their their valuation and how much money they raise at the moment. Yeah, sure. What type of businesses are are attracting attention from investors right now then, Sarah? I suppose the obvious one is AI-orientated companies and automation. So, you know, absolutely AI is generating a huge amount of attention and investment, but also kind of, I suppose, what we call less sexy businesses, things that are kind of you know, will make businesses operate more efficiently. So they make things work faster and cheaper. Things that are sticky, once your client is signed up, it's very difficult for them to leave. You know, these are all the principles that we're looking for. Also, things that are kind of genuinely need to have. Anything that's a bit sort of a nice to have at the moment is lower down the shopping list. I think consumer... Anything consumer oriented is 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 struggling quite a lot at the moment, unless it's something that is genuinely recession proof. Right, that's interesting. I think cost savings and efficiency is the sort of it, that's in fashion at the moment, it's in vogue at the moment. I suppose yeah. then, yeah. Now that that's really interesting. So, what what kind of technology innovation are you most excited about in the world right now, Sarah? I mean, you know, we've touched on AI, and everyone's talking about that. You know. <laughs> both the kind of the opportunities and the threats and both are both are very interesting i suppose my approach i've always kind of you know i love technology and i love the possibility but i'm sort of it's it's the ends rather than the the means of getting there so we've done a lot of healthcare investments and using 
technology and it's not always even very complicated technology but things we can do to make healthcare systems people in the healthcare systems work better together collaborate more efficient triaging tools things that help frontline workers do some of the work of clinicians so that yeah. you know that resources are deployed more efficiently we're seeing a lot of businesses like that and then, of course, you know, ones that are using AI to improve diagnostics and to find, accelerate treatments and, you know, yeah, yeah you know, I think there's the huge potential to transform healthcare and, um, you know, improve preventive healthcare as well, not just diagnosis and treatment. So that's an area where I'm, I'm very excited about seeing some fantastic, businesses that are deploying AI and other technologies just to, you know, ha- help reverse climate change. So I think mm. there's a lot in the kind of the materials area. There's a lot of discussion, isn't there, about um, single-use plastic and, and concerns about that. But, you know, surely we can come up with a recyclable type of plastic because there yeah. are areas where we can never avoid using single single use plastic so for example yeah, in sure. healthcare because of you know hygiene concerns and things like that the health tech innovation some of it is is you know biotech meditech that it is it's it's really like it's not just you know improving how quick you can access your online banking you know it's uh, this is changing people's lives isn't it you know it's saving yeah. lives and stuff like that and there's some amazing uk companies so, so you've given us a really good snapshot of the current investment landscape okay for startups right now especially female for female entrepreneurs especially but i wanted to get your take on the future okay we we discussed you know your optimistic outlook on the um obviously female entrepreneurship and stuff like that but just in terms of how startup founders engage with potential investors um how do you see this evolving over the next couple of years do you, do you see any innovation to connect the investor with the entrepreneur do, do you, you know is there anything that's improving and you think is going to be a bit of a game changer in this this process of, of sourcing capital from the marketplace to grow your company every day i see a new platform trying to kind of connect investors and entrepreneurs or do a bit of that process sure. you know do the deal flow analysis and stuff like that but you know there are so many platforms that there's not going to be any one that solves all the problems and you know it's going to be quite a fragmented market and when you're investing in really early stage businesses it's so much about the founding team that you know mm. although we can rely on technology to do quite a lot of the things it is about getting to know them and building trust in them and then spending a bit of time getting to know us and building sure. our trust in them. And, you know, uh, you know, technology, you can look up, you can look them up on LinkedIn and there's publicly available information and there are even sort of, you know, tests you can get them to run. But ultimately it is about spending a bit of time with them. So maybe I'm being old fashioned, but I don't think it's something that, technology can kind of entirely entirely yeah. solve um, yeah that makes they total can help sense. bits and pieces of it but at, at you know at the end of the day is people investing in people yeah it's a bit like recruitment isn't it or sales or something like that it's just a very human endeavor the technology can certainly make things more efficient but it's never going to replace do you know what I mean? You, if you, if you as a business owner need to hire someone, especially if it's a critical hire, you can't be sitting down and looking in the whites of their eyes. Okay, you can do it over Teams, maybe, but I think there's certain things you just cannot replicate. I think that's right, and I think it's one of the kind of the great things about AI, and you know, all the sort of experiments I've run on Chat GPT. It's it's amazing what it does, but if you're not giving it the right prompts, it, what comes out is a bit. It sounds good, but it might not be right if it's actually yeah. a subject you know about. So, you know, I've seen all these AI generated lists of the, you know, the top 10 angel investors in London or whatever. And the people that come up on that, their lists are rubbish because obviously the person who's run the <laughs> query doesn't really know how to, how to prompt chat GPT to, yeah, to yeah. come up with a good list. And so we're going to need human 
expertise, aren't we? We always yeah, sure. will need human expertise and people who understand their domain and 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 what works. And you know, that's the sort of the joyful bit of our jobs. Hopefully, the AI will take some of the painful tedious stuff out of it that's what i'm <laughs> hoping how much of a whiz are you with ChatGPT, sarah are you a bit of a prompt engineering genius or are you just getting started or what you know i i do a certain amount of posting on social media and i think how oh, great can write all my posts for me but actually you've got to do the thinking haven't you this is yeah um, and then i just kind of end up just writing it myself because uh, <laughs> um, i do that as well I'll, I'll, I'll automate this and then you end up doing it spending more time than you would anyway you know I mean, we're obviously early days. It is going to get better and better, isn't it? And when there's more of my stuff to analyse, then it probably will be able to be spookily, uh, spookily like me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but sure. <better>. Absolutely. <laughs> I think we are very, very early. And uh, what, what I always try to draw attention to is if it's this good now, these large long language models like ChatGPT, can you imagine what it's going to be like in five years or even 10 years? It's going to be scary, isn't it? So I think there's, um, there's lots of change ahead. And I think um, I just find it quite strange how so many people haven't really embraced ChatGBT to do certain things, you know, because it is such a helping hand when you're researching. If you've got any sort of job where you have to sit in front of a computer screen all day, ChatGBT can probably provide a hell of a lot of value to anything you're working on, you know. It's free. Go and have a play. You just need to sign up. Go and have a play and find out what it can yeah. do for you. And I think that's a rallying cry to everyone who's listening. Yeah, no, I, I have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> so looking back on your career now, Sarah, okay, and I know you've got a long way to go, but just in your armchair now, looking back on what's happened so far... What, what advice would you give to your 21-year-old self or, or just somebody, you know, your younger self, maybe around the time you completed your master's or something, knowing what you know now, what, what advice would you give to that person? Um, uh, just do it, JDI. <laughs> it's, it's what I tell all aspiring investors is just, you know, just, just do one, find a deal you like, you know, do the due diligence, join join the deal team at Angel Academy and 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 do it yeah. because the more you do the more you learn the more yeah. confident you get doing it and the more fun yeah I, I don't know if this is a British thing I've spoken to a number of, of American entrepreneurs and and, um, and British entrepreneurs and asked them about this but I think there seems to be a fear uh, and it's a bit of a British thing a fear of making mistakes whereas it's the Americans for example tend to be a little bit more they kind of, ha- you know, having a failed startup is like a badge of honor in America, isn't it? You know what I mean? Because it's just like, <laughs> oh, I'm going to get it next time, you know? Whereas in Britain, I think we're a bit more terrified of failure. Do you, do you, do you see that? Do you think there's a bit of a fear of, of what their friends are going to say if it fails, so therefore they just never start? You know, is that a thing? I think that's definitely a, definitely a thing, isn't it? And failure is really hard. And if you've taken investor money as well, you know, that that's tough you have to say to these people that you know I'm sorry it didn't go the way any of us wanted it to go and you have to take that on your chin um we're quite often investing in people who have it have done it before not necessarily a failure but a business that that didn't do brilliantly well but you know because they've they've they know what it takes They've made the mistakes in the previous business, so hopefully next time round they can they can get it right. I'd certainly be better my next business. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I completely agree. I absolutely agree. And I think coming from you, that's probably quite powerful because I know you've got a, a glittering career. And, and that brings me on to my next point, Sarah, as the second most influential woman in tech in 2023, Ooh. according to Computer <laughs> Weekly. So congratulations on that, by the way. That is, a, that is some honor. The question I wanted to ask you, Sarah, you're obviously a very busy individual. You're working with startup, you know, an angel network, probably start startups directly yourself and multiple other things. How do you stay organized and productive? How do you, how do you achieve balance in your career and your life? I think ask any any entrepreneur balance <laughs> is out of the window i you know <laughs> uh we all work very very long hours <laughs> but yeah. it's something that we're completely committed to we've got the freedom on the one hand of not answering to anyone and working where we like but it is um tough so i don't think i have too much balance in my 
life, not right now. But in terms of productivity, I think, you know, surround yourself with the best people you can find, people who are smarter than you. And that yeah. that is what my angel group gives me. I mean, they are the most incredible resource. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I found this amazing business. And they'll say, oh, but did you think about this and this and this? And I go, oh, no, no, I didn't. Thank you. So sure. I think that the, you know, the value of working with a really, really good team, big productivity hack, I've, you know, found Zoom the last few years, tools like Calendly and LinkedIn and yeah. well, all the standard stuff. But I think it's the people people first yeah for sure no that's it's really useful and i've got to ask you this one to finish then sarah Are you much of a reader we always ask the guests for a book a book recommendation if you're not much of a reader you can you can use a, a different piece of content if you like uh, have you been inspired by a piece of content recently that you'd like to mention yeah i'm 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 reading an Anne pratchett book at the moment which is very good it's all her non-fiction and that's got nothing to do with technology but um you know what one of the other people i was thinking about is dame stephanie shirley as a kind of i'm not sure if she's written a book or um there's been a book about her but fantastic yeah. female role model technology entrepreneur back in the day oh, okay she's phenomenal if you haven't heard of her i have i'm not familiar with her stephanie shirley so she set up a, an it business in the 1970s and these were the days where if you were you know actually quite a few women worked in computing but they all had to leave their jobs when they had families but sure. she employed these women to work part-time from home on on it projects but she nicknamed herself steve and would kind of book meetings in the name of Steve Shirley because if she used her own name then yeah. people wouldn't meet with her because you know they'd wow. know she was a woman so yeah she steamed her way into these businesses and won these contracts <laughs> uh, oh, by wow, pretending to be a man and then employed all these other women to deliver them oh my god that's incredible that's that, yeah. why is so it we think we've got it hard now I think those are the days when it was really tough and you know the other well lots of amazing things about her but she came to this country as a child refugee so she was on the yeah. kinder transport so has really had quite a full life and is now a major major campaigner for autism charities because her her son is autistic so really quite phenomenal accomplished successful woman yeah, absolutely. But it looks like she was born in Germany during the Holocaust and she's a, a, a Jewish lady who came to the um, UK. Wow. OK, um, I'm just just looking at a Wikipedia page. That looks like a um, something you'd, you'd make a film about, isn't it? But um, yeah, it looks incredible. Definitely. It's a life, a life lived. 100%. Well, we'll put, we'll put some reference to that in the show notes. So thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. <laughs> Where can people find out about uh, Angel Academy and yourself, Sarah? Where can people reach out to Angel Academy as well? So our website. So we're Angel Academy, spelt A-C-A-D-E-M-E dot com. So yeah. uh, I think if you type in the other kind of academy, it will probably be you'll find us as well. So lots of information for aspiring investors, but also entrepreneurs that want to come and pitch to our group. We've got an online application form. We'll read every single application. So please do apply that way. It is the fastest way onto our radar. That is very very good to know we will make sure that Please. is front and center so hopefully there are some investor well investors listening and potentially even entrepreneurs as well so uh so yeah but thank you so much sarah for coming on the tech leaders podcast it has been an absolute joy thank you so much for having me i've really enjoyed it oh wow that was great i really enjoyed that one sarah is very easy to talk to and yet another female entrepreneur and uh, who has just blown my socks off uh, in it super interesting individual super experienced full of value full of wisdom what more can i say i really enjoyed chatting with sarah i'm not aware of any other female orientated investment network or angel investment network i think it's it's quite a unique organization and you know, as she said herself it's not that they you know are actively trying to avoid male entrepreneurs it's more a case of there is a, a clear 
lack of gender balance in the tech sector. Nobody can deny that. It is clearly there. I mean, Sarah's figures were quite shocking. Two, three percent of founders of startups who, who'd received investment were female. Um, and I think that, you know, there may be issues there with female entrepreneurs getting investment. But I think the biggest issue is female entrepreneurs pursuing investment in the first place. All of those numbers need to change. And and I think organizations like Angel Academy are massively leading the charge uh, to a more balanced future. But look, I, I think it was amazing to get Sarah's take on that and what we can do to potentially get more females into the sector, get females more ambitious to want to set up technology, software orientated businesses. So much stands out. But I really think the interesting part was Sarah's take on the current investment landscape. Now, I've heard lots of viewpoints and perspectives on this. Um, there's been a serious slowdown in investment capital in the last 18 months. And Sarah, just give us some really valuable insight, not only on what's going on out there right now, but also why it's it's happening. There was, in her words, quite a lot of exuberance. The flow of money was very, it, it was quite clear that there was, you know, there was money going into companies who may not have had a very robust model. You know, there's a bit of lack of diligence going on in, in some cases. And I think that has maybe come back to bite investors in many cases. And I think there's just a lot more meticulous behavior around assessing investment opportunities now and i think there's just less investment capital going into companies who are who are more growth led the investment capital is still there but it's going into more profit led organizations it's just a more sensible landscape right now and i think that that was fantastic insight amongst a buffet of many other fantastic points that sarah made in this interview i really enjoyed this one i think it was just uh, yeah it's everything you you ask for in a guest yeah i hope you enjoyed it too thank you so much for downloading please don't forget to subscribe and thank you so much for supporting the tech leaders podcast